Shem Hashem Na'asev V'Natzliach, Shir Torah, Bukhim Ba'im. We're back on our new week, Sunday night Shir, but uh, unlike the uh, weekly Shir Torah that we have uh, as part of the series of the Jewish Ashkafa, tonight we'll have a uh, special Shir that uh, I thought is very appropriate for the times, uh, especially after seeing what impact a little bit of this Shir had on some people uh, when we spoke about it last week. Uh, in regards to um, the many topics we discussed in it was a part of the shiu, and uh, in fact it made such a big impact on some people's lives that uh, it seems very appropriate to uh, elaborate further on it. Tonight's shiu is uh, going to be for the Refuah Shlema for uh, Talia Bat Sara, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Avi Mori David Ben Esriah, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora. Uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides, also for Refua uh, Shlema for Sarah Bat Levana, and uh, all of the wonderful people that continue to uh, support and join us in all the amazing things that the organization is doing. Anyone that wants to uh, donate can go to bhtorah.org or bezrathashem.org or one of the other many uh, avenues that we have to uh, donate on the app, on the website, and, uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, as I was uh, saying, the uh, shiur tonight is uh, not a typical shiur, uh, where, uh, you know, typically we're talking about a shkafa, and really, even though I, you know, Bo Hashem, we could have easily snuck this topic into the uh, series, uh, you know, because after all, it is part of a shkafa, uh, I thought that it's more appropriate to simply have one Sure about this that's going to uh, really elaborate on the topic uh, where uh, everyone, including the atheists, the non-believers, the scorners, and uh, those that uh, still consider themselves religious, uh, knows the uh, very famous verse of how God created us in His image. As the Torah says in Sefer Bereshit, the book of Genesis, in the first chapter, so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is a very famous uh, verse. Everyone knows it. Everyone has heard it at least once or twice. Uh, you know, and it's uh, very well known by uh, people that, uh, you know, usually uh, don't want to hear something that Torah is saying to them. Uh, because they feel like they're being picked on because uh, what the Torah is saying is that they have to change their life. And uh, they want to think that uh, they're perfect. So they'll remind you that in the image of God, Hashem created me. Now the question really is, what does that actually mean? As we know, one of the 13 principles of faith that the Rambam uh, taught us is that God has no image or the likeness of an image. So what does it mean that God created us in His image? Now, the basic translation of it is the fact that just like Hashem uh, has the, uh, the, the, you know, the willpower to do everything, He gave us the willpower to do everything, to do good, to do bad, to think, that's in essence, more or less, the very basic explanation of it. But really... The, the topic is much deeper than that, especially when you ask the, uh, the follow-up question, which is that if he created us in his image, how are we doing? How are we doing with this image? I mean, if you look at the world at large right now, uh, it doesn't look like we're doing so well. You have war in practically every corner of the world, and if they're not at war, they're preparing for one. Terrorism... Uh, is uh, simply a standard in different parts of the world, especially in Eretz Israel. Every day I get different messages from people on the, uh, on the field, uh, literally with pictures and videos of different terror attacks that are not reported on the media, on the news. Uh, you're literally seeing these terrorists just going into uh, different busy neighborhoods in Eretz Israel and just shooting people, stabbing people, 99.9% .9 of all of it is never reported in uh, the uh, Western media. But needless to say, this is something that uh, many uh, Israelis uh, can never get used to, but they're getting used to it. So if you look at that, that doesn't look like the image of God. If you look at the war, it doesn't look like the image of God. Now let's, if we look at business, 
If we look at business, we're seeing that there are many major corporations that uh, are proving that they have been lying to their investors. They've been lying to their shareholders. They've been lying to their cons consumers. Uh, and after getting a uh, fine, that's only a small percentage of all of the money they made from it. They simply put a bandage on a pig and uh, they move on with their life. You know, if you look at the business world today, it doesn't look like God's image. Then if you look at the role models, the role models, or at least what is the role models, unfortunately, for many people today, the celebrities of the world, it's literally one pedophile, sex addict, drug de degenerate after another. Uh, if the stories of the past uh, five or ten years were not enough, we're getting a whole new realm of new stories hitting the media now with these new pedophiles, these new degenerates that have been degenerate losers and abusers for many, many years, but simply didn't get caught until now. It wasn't their time. Uh, but now the media needs some more stories. The uh, police force needs something else to do, something else to justify their existence. So you see more of this stuff coming out, stuff that was already obvious decades ago is becoming obvious, I told you so today. So you're seeing that. So it doesn't obviously look like the image of God. The hatred in society today only resembles pre-World War II. There is an enormous amount of anti-Semitism in practically every corner of the internet, which is much, much bigger than every corner of the actual world itself, physical world, because literally the internet is, is massive. Uh, and uh, you're seeing that uh, people are spewing hatred uh, as if it is a good thing to do. And they're justifying it and they're having other uh, people that are building a stage off of their hatred. So obviously that's not the image of God. Uh, well, let's look at personal lives. The, uh, the, the marriages versus the divorces, the uh, morality of society, need I say more? Divorces have become a standard in every person's life, practically. They're, ex you know, they're getting married, but they're expecting that this is only going to be temporary. It's become like the old boyfriend-girlfriend nonsense that people do. You know, where you have a, uh, every child is no longer traumatized by the fact that their parents are divorced because he has friends that have already two or three or four different fathers and he's only 10 years old. The uh, morality in society has gone down the drain. You're seeing that uh, people literally do their business everywhere and anywhere and in fact even videotape themselves just to make sure that they can make some money out of their degeneracy. So it doesn't look like that's the image of God. So then we would hope, we would hope, at the very least, we would hope that we, the chosen people, or those that are trying to be the chosen people, either by converting or simply being one of the Jews that's in the part, you know, process of doing tshuva, we would expect more from ourselves. We would expect that our lives, our morality, our business ethics, our everything is on the up and up. And although that is true, if you compare us to society, it's not necessarily always true if you compare us to what we're supposed to be. Because one of the major things that is simply, you know, ringing red, blue, green, all types of other color bells on a daily basis is either the divorce rates that are on the rise, the immorality that's on the rise, the unfortunately lack of ethics in some businesses that's also on the rise. So it's time that we actually really look at what are we supposed to be? What does it mean the people that are created in the image of God. He doesn't have a body. He doesn't have hands and ears and eyes. So certainly, resembling that resembles nothing. So what does it mean to really resemble God? Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us from nothing. He created everything from nothing. As the Gemara says in Masechet Chagigad that HaKadosh Baruch Hu first wrote the Torah 974 generations before he created the world, and then he looked at the Torah as, in essence, an instruction set, a blueprint, in order to create the world. Now, part of that creation was man, was mankind. 
Now, of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew that not everyone is going to be Jewish. Not everyone is going to be the chosen people. But needless to say, everyone is his creation. Everyone is supposed to be his servants. Some serve in one place, others in serving in another place. But nonetheless, we're all supposed to be serving. But at the same token, the original creation was the same across the board. Meaning, we were all giving originally the same exact tools. Tools that we could still use today if we choose to. And the Torah says in several places that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created man yeshal, straight, honest, perfect. But then they came and started to do accounting and ruined it. How do you ruin God's creation? And thereby ruin your life. And thereby create all of the horrible things we just mentioned. He created us yeshal, created us straight, created us perfect. In fact, once we look further into it, we'll see how much more he gave us what really this means. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us completely full, full of wisdom, full of love, full of care, full of empathy, full of all the best stuff. And therefore, Hashem says, if you're empty, that's all due to you. You have emptied yourself out. Because when I created you, I created you full. Now, Hashem used the best materials in order to create His man. And the Ramchal, Rabbi Chaim Moshe Luzato, writes about 300 years ago that the famous question of if he loves us so much and if he gave us everything that you know is, is so great why don't he just leave us in heaven why bring us to this world so we have to deal with all this craziness the, the, the divorces the immorality the, the the strange behaviors of people and society why don't he just leave us in a perfect place and the Ramchal answers it he says that when a man loves something when a man loves something, of course this is an analogy, as Hashem is not a man, as the Torah tells us Hashem is not a man, that he would change his mind. But he gives an analogy, he says that when a man loves something, or someone, he makes sure to give it the best. So as an example that Rabbi Ephraim gave, said if somebody loves his wife, they're going to buy her let's say, a piece of jewelry, you're going to buy our chain from the best stuff, the best diamonds, the best that their money could afford. The more they love, the, that will be in line with the more they could afford. But if he doesn't love her so much, he'll still buy her a chain, but it may be a bicycle chain. A Kadosh Baruch Hu did the same thing. Hashem created us from the best of what is available, from what exists. And therefore, he said, he created us betzelem elokim, from the best parts of all of creation. He took from the four corners of the world, he took the dust. From the best traits of each one of the other creatures, he took, whether it's from the lion, that he took the gvura, the, uh, the, uh, um, the strength, or he took from the bear, or he took from the horse, or he took from the snake, from every single one of the creatures, he took the best thing from them and he gave it to man. So when he, gave, when he created us, he literally gave us everything. Because he loves us. Because he loved his creation. Because he wanted his creation to succeed. And he therefore gave it all of the possible tools for that creation to succeed. But that doesn't answer the question of why did he do it in the first place? Why create? 
this world if heaven is so good. And the Gemara in Masechet Ta'anit says, Hashem only gives. He doesn't take. He doesn't get anything unlike what heretics would like you to believe. You cannot give Hashem anything. Your prayers are for you. You're praying for Hashem to help you. You're praying for Hashem to bring you salvation. You're praying for Hashem to give you sustenance, health, and so on. To alleviate and eliminate your loneliness, your poverty. Your learning of Torah is for yourself. So you know the ways of God. You know how to serve Him. You know how to get your prayers answered. All of the actions that you do are for you. They're self-serving. Hashem does not take, He only gives. In fact, He gives so much that He even gives to the heretics. Those very same people that scorn at the thought of God, that make fun of it, to despise it. He gives them too. He gives them eyes and ears that they'll use against him. He gives them lips and speech that they'll use against him. He gives them ideas that they're able to generate with the brain he gave them that they'll use against him. He gives them all those tools even though they are enemies. Hashem doesn't take. He gives. Now, of course, at some point, Life ends for everyone, and the judgment has to be paid. But all in all, in this world, so long as a person is here, they're here, and they are getting endless supplies from HaKadosh Baruch Hu on top of what He already gave them. Because the way of good is to do good. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the ultimate good. And the way of good is to create good. That's why he did all of it. He didn't do it because he needed it. He's already perfect. He did it because it's good to do good. Now, with that being said, since he created us in his image, Says the Ramchal, that means that our nature originally was to be like him. To be a giver just like him. To only give and not take. But then it all got ruined. Why? We started to do cheshbonot. What's cheshbonot? We started to do accounting. We started to do accounting of well, if I give this to him, what am I going to get out of it? Okay, so I'm going to lend him my car, but does he have a car that I want to borrow? Does he have money that I need? Does he have somebody that I want to get to know? What can he do for me? What can she do for me? We started to do cheshbonot and we ruined it. And we continue to ruin it. Every single day that we do more and more accounting of why should I give? Why give? In fact, Rabotai, the more a person starts to do accounting of why to give, the more they not only ruin their connection to the image of God, but the more they become like something else, something that perhaps may surprise you, but nonetheless, not for long. You see, the more somebody gives, and the more somebody is a giver, the more godly they become, because God only gives. On the other hand, to ruin a godly power requires an enormous amount of strength. I mean, just think about it. God created us as givers. He gave us His tzelem, His image. So therefore, to ruin this is 
something that's not just like, oh, I don't feel like doing it. It has to be much more than that. It has to be much more than a feeling. It has to be much more than an idea. Now, Chazal teaches that this spiritual power that overcomes this Tselem Elohim by permission of God only is not just any power, but something that is in the root of all of the different abilities that HaKadosh Baruch Hu instilled into this world. Chazal tell us that Kishuf, Kishuf is like witchcraft. Kishuf is like the using the supernatural uh, for evil. It's in order to influence the heavenly powers, the decisions of the heavenly powers, towards the evil side, towards the negative side. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed this to happen also in order for it to be a place of free choice where people can choose good or bad. As the Torah says, that you chose life. What does it mean you chose life? You chose God. God who is the one that creates chayim, who creates life. But when you don't choose chayim, when you don't choose God, you choose something else. Now, the decision to take or to give is not necessarily as simple as one would think. Because... While God is the one that only gives, He created another power, if you will, that only takes. And that is the Satan. The Satan is the one that only takes. And therefore, anyone that deals with anything that has to do with witchcraft or evil, demons, all types of Mezikim, Ruchot, all of these different powers of evil is sure to pay a price, a very heavy price, much more than they gain. In fact, even those that use it for good. For example, like Tzadikim, the Kabbalist Rabbi Yudaftaya, who used to have to deal with the evil when he would try to help people and rescue them from being a prisoner of some dibuk where a spirit of someone evil that died entered a person and took control over the body in order for him to be able to convince that evil soul, that evil spirit, to get out of this person, he would have to, in essence, deal with them. He would have to communicate with them. He would have to convince them. He would have to even give them spiritual beatings, literally, by using holy names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But nonetheless, he had to deal with the evil, even though it was for the sake of good, even though it was from the good side. He wasn't using witchcraft like some of these people use today where they use all types of uh, cards and Ouija boards and incense and all types of other uh, uh, witchcraft tools. He was using the power that literally is learned through an endless amount of effort and sacrifice from the Torah in order to help people remove these mazikim, remove these dibukim from taking control of their life any further. And some of these people would come to them, uh, come to him after being a prisoner in, t- in this situation for years. And after even going to all types of uh, witchcraft sorcerers and people that had abilities, but were not able to uh, take these things out. And Ibo Hashem succeeded time and time again. Now, there's a whole sefer that's written about it, Ruchot Mesaprot, where it's in essence like a journal of the different conversations and experiences that he had with these uh, uh, these different uh, dibukim. One of them is with the uh, infamous Shabtai Tzvi, Shem Reshaim Irkab, that was one of the famous false messiahs from a few hundred years ago, caused uh, literally endless damage, almost as much as what, as what Yoshke did, but not quite. Uh, but nonetheless, Rabbi Yudaftaya did all of this for the sake of Am Yisrael, for the sake of helping people. 
But nonetheless, he still dealt with the Kish, world of Kishuf, the world of the evil, and he ended up losing two of his sons. Two of his sons died. The price that they pay for is very, very dear. This is also the reason why many people are simply not able to do what Rabbi Yudaftaya did. It's not just because of the knowledge and the ultimate sacrifice of your own personal life, but it's literally also things that are very dear to you can sometimes be lost in the process. So here we see that the decision to take or to give is not just a decision to be good or not good, but rather a decision to either be godly or to be like the Satan. Because that's what the Satan does. The Satan only takes. People that deal with witchcraft ultimately lose a whole lot more than what they gained. But in the process, they give. They give their blood, literally seed, all types of different acts, sacrifices. They give an endless supply of things they don't really think are as important as what they're getting, only to find out later on they have imprisoned themselves for eternity as a result of it. Because coming out of it is virtually impossible unless it's death. Very few end up coming out of it and live. As the Gemara says that people that deal with these things, typically when they try to get out, they die. Now, the Satan knows that the one thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us to defeat him is the Torah. But in order to emulate HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the highest level and to be like Hashem, to be like God, we have to become givers. Givers to no end. And this Rabotai is a tool that destroys the Satan in a lot of different ways. And therefore the Satan created a tool that has fooled society for some time and continues to. In today's Hebrew language, they call it Freyel. What's Freyel? In in English, you would call it like a sucker, a fool, someone that everyone takes advantage of. They're just taking his stuff. Why? Because sometimes a person wants to give and... He doesn't want to do the accounting. He wants to do something nice for his wife. But he doesn't want to do the accounting. Oh, what am I going to do? Is she going to do this for me? She did that for me. Oh, but last time. No, he says, you know what? Let me just get her something nice just because it's nice to get her something nice. Let me just do something good just because it's good to do good. Let me do something good for him just because it's good to do good. But then the Satan comes and says, Then you want to do good because it's good to do good, but uh, when did you become a sucker? When did you become a friar that uh, people could just take, take, take from you and uh, and that's it? Did you ever get anything? And if you got something, what did you really get? What? You bought a $10,000 diamond, what did you get? Dinner? You could buy dinner for 10 bucks. Is it really worth it? What'd you do? You worked every day. You put overtime. Every day you worked for this company. You built them. You put this company on the map. What'd they give you? What'd they give you? A stock bonus? What'd they give you? $20,000? $100,000? They made billions. Ah, why should you continue working? Why should you continue doing so much for this company? And a person starts to think, wait a minute. Why am I being a sucker? Why am I doing so much for everybody else and uh, they're not really doing anything for me that's uh, in the same level or at all? And that's when the Satan starts to win. 
But some people have a very, very strong connection to the image of God. And therefore, they're not really so concerned about being a frail, being a sucker. They're not afraid of that. No, no, listen. Yeah, I know that I worked really hard for this company. And perhaps they uh, maybe made a whole lot more, more, more than me. I know I did a whole lot more for my husband than he's been doing for me. I know I did a whole lot more for my kids than they did for me. I know I did a whole lot more than uh, my parents have done for me. And so on and so forth. But let me just do it. Anyway, let me just help them out here. Let me give them a ride there. Let me contribute here, contribute there. Why? Because I want to be good. I want to be good. So Satan says, oh, this one is a tough cookie. Okay. We'll have to send them tool number two. What's tool number two? A bunch of messengers from the Satan that literally have been programmed to be just like the Satan, which is takers. He sends him a bunch of takers. He sends him a bunch of people that all they know how to do is just take. They contribute nothing to no one but themselves. And even themselves, they're sometimes stingy about it. Even themselves, they think twice before they go to the bathroom, lest they have to buy food again. Even themselves, they're stingy on. But worst of all, they're stingy on anything that involves benefiting anybody else. But when it comes to taking, they are top world professionals. If it was a decree, if it was a degree, they would have the master's PhD combined. They are world experts at taking, and they'll take everything even if they don't need it. And they love to take. They want to take. And the Satan sends them to you. And now they're taking. And you give. Why? Because you want to give. Because you like to give. Because it's good to give. Why not give? Okay, so he needs to give them. And they come back the next day. Oh, you again? Yeah, yeah, I thought you had uh, that. Yeah, yeah, sure. You need more? Yeah, you have? Sure, okay. And he's starting to feel almost like a, like a drug dealer. All of a sudden, this guy keeps coming back. He's like an addict. And as long as you're giving, he's taking, even if he doesn't need it. And all of a sudden, Tom, listen, but, but, but you already got three, four, five, six times. Yeah, you know, no, this is not for me. Oh, it's not? So why are you here? Oh, it's for my friend. Your friend? Why didn't your friend come? No, no, he's embarrassed. He's embarrassed. He lives far away. He lives far. His mother died. His horse broke its leg. You know, his baby just threw up. I thought he didn't have any kids. No, no, if it, if it was born, it would have thrown up today. And that's why I, I want to help him. Be, you know, I, I want to do good before it's needed. You know, it'd be like a sham, you know, like to bring the cure before the ailment. He'll start giving you analogies and examples of why he's here to take. You're so fed up of hearing from it. He's like, oh, just take, just take, just go, go, go. Go already, go take already. And the next day is back. And the next week is back. And as soon as he sees maybe this uh, possibility of you not giving, so I'll take a break for a couple of days, a week, a month, and I'll come back and take some more. Why? He's a taker. But not just any taker. He's an expert, professional, master's, PhD, doctorate, degree, and a decree. A degree and a decree. This one is like a kaparat avonot in the making. And you don't even know what to do with yourself. It's like, oh man, this guy keeps taking. And now he brought his friend. He really has a friend. The friend's the same thing as him. And they're just taking. And then there's another guy. There's another guy. He's like, whoa, come on. How much are they taking? What am I, a friar? Oh, all of a sudden, that word came into your vocabulary. All of a sudden, you're starting to think like the Satan has wanted you to think all the time. What? What am I, sucker? What am I? Why am I giving? Let them go and get it somewhere else. Why do I have to give it to them? And all of a sudden you're starting to do cheshbonot. You're starting to do accounting. Accounting. Why? Akadosh Baruch Hu gave you the task of being like him. The ability to be like him. 
the image like his. The Satan doesn't like it. Why? Every time you give, you become more godly. Oh, we don't want you godly. We want you satanly. We want you to be a taker. So how do we convince you? We'll try to convince you with some words. We'll try to convince you with some speech. We'll try to convince you with somebody trying to influence you. Your wife, your husband, your friend. Why are you giving? Why? Why are you giving? That doesn't work. So we'll send you those messengers of the Satan that will start taking but not giving. And if you fail there, it's like you failed everywhere else. And this Rabotai is how a person can lose the steam that he had, the steam of giving, the power of giving like God, just in order to avoid being what's called a friar, the, the, the sucker. Now it's gone to such a point, this whole perception has gone to such a point that in society today, people that do not like to give also don't like to see other people giving. In fact, they will always have something nasty to say when they see somebody else giving. Like, why is he giving lectures for free? What's the catch? Why is he giving books for free? What's the catch? Why is he giving food for free? What's the catch? Why is he giving money for free to the poor people? What's the catch? Oh, it's a cult. Oh, he really is not giving. He really is taking and he's doing this and they'll start all, have all types of convoluted story of why it's not possible that somebody else would give. Why? Because they themselves are not givers. But this poison starts to infiltrate different types of people, including those that want to give, including those that are good. And many times, this is not just in the world of tzedakah and charity, it's also in the world of marriage. Where all of a sudden, you have a coffee with your uh, girlfriend, and you and her, two girls, are having, not girlfriend, boyfriend, two girls, one is married, and the other one is divorced. And they're talking and chit-chatting, and all of a sudden... You know, she's telling you about how she's so much happier now that she's divorced. And she's happy that he's out of her life. He tortured her. He was bad to her. He never did this and he never did that. He didn't buy me this. He didn't send me there. Now I can do what I want. Now I can go where I want. And she's making it seem so glamorous to be divorced. And until now, you were happy in your marriage. You are perfectly happy. Your husband's very nice. Kids love you. Kids love him. Everything is good. Until you get that phone call. And your husband calls you. He says, honey, did you pick up the kids today? No, no, no. I thought it was your turn. Oh, yeah, it was mine, but I can't do it. Can you just do it to me, please? Okay, yeah, sure, honey. No problem. I'll pick up the kids. And you hang up. He's like, huh, listen, I got to go. Why? Because I gotta go pick up my kids. Why? Because your husband said so? Why didn't he go? Well, well, he's busy. Oh, so his time is worth more than yours? See, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. See, I, I don't have that. I have freedom. Nobody tells me what to do. Why is his time more valuable than yours? Maybe you're having a conversation to solve world problems. And you're like, well, I'm not. I'm just having coffee with you. But how does he know that? How does he know that all of a sudden she starts to put all types of new junk, new broken tools into your mind? You're like, oh, no, come on. Okay, I'm just going to go pick up my kids. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow or next week or, or whenever. But this starts to seep in. Why? Because you allowed it. And on the way to pick up your kids, you're starting to think, why is it that I'm going to pick up my kids? I mean, it's his kids also. Why do I have to pick them up? I mean... What, because he's stuck in an appointment? He should have made an appointment at a different time. 
And all of a sudden, you pick up the kids, you're not really so happy about it. You love the kids and everything is good with them, but you're a little bit bitter inside that this happened. But okay, no problem. But a few days later, it happens again. A few days later, he forgot to buy the groceries. And he says, oh, I forgot. Can you just get it? I'm really tired from work. Okay. And all of a sudden, the way to the supermarket to get some stuff for Shabbat, that same vulture, I mean girlfriend of yours, she calls. Hey, what are you doing? You want to get some coffee? No, I can't. Why not? Well, I have to get some groceries so we get ready for Shabbat. Well, why don't your husband do it? Well, you know, he's busy. He's, got, he's tired from work. Oh, and you're not tired? Well, you just sat there and did nothing all day? He's the only one that works? He's the only one that does things? No, come on, stop it with that again. No, no, everything is okay. I'll talk to you later. And you hang up, and in reality, the venom is in. And you start to think again, wait, why is it that I'm going? Why can't he just go? Even though he's tired, I mean, how much effort does it take to go to the supermarket and just get a couple of pieces of meat and some stuff? Like, why can't he go? And all of a sudden, you're letting this poison of, what am I, a flyer? Am I a sucker that I have to go and pick up the groceries? Am I a sucker that I have to go pick up the kids? Am I a sucker that I have to do this and I have to do that? And all of a sudden, you're starting to resemble the Satan. You're starting to resemble the Satan. If not in your actions, then at least in your mind. Why? Because you don't want to be a giver. You're tired of being a giver. Why? Being a giver makes you look like a sucker, according to your friend. According to the Torah, it makes you look godly. But according to your friend, sucker. According to society, sucker. According to everyone's divorced, sucker. Happily married, godly. But you're not asking them for advice. You're not asking the godly people for advice. You're asking all of the divorcees. You're asking all of them the miseries. You're asking all of the stingy, excuse of a human being people for advice. Why? Because all they can give you is the advice that got them divorced. The advice that got them to their misery because they don't know of any other way. They got into a relationship because they were looking for somebody to give them stuff. I'll marry him if he has XYZ. I'll marry him if he has this and such career. I'll marry him if he is this and that height. I'll marry him if he has this and that house. I'll marry her if she looks like this, this and that. I'll marry her if she comes from such and such family. I'll marry her if she's willing to do this, this, and this for me. People get into relationships that are bound to get divorced. Not because you're ugly, not because you're pretty, not because you're rich, and not because you're poor. But rather because they're coming into the relationship in order to take they come into the, to the relationship, instead of being a spouse, they're looking to be a leech. What can I get out of this? And when the blood runs out, and the well runs dry, even for a moment, a fight breaks out. Why, you can't give it to me anymore? Why, you don't want to give it to him anymore? Oh, so you never really wanted to give it. Oh, so the whole thing was fake. And all of a sudden, that friend of yours that's divorced happily, happily divorced for a few years, at least that's what she says, and that's what he says, sounds more like somebody that you would want to be. And Rabutai Karim, people have developed a mindset. That if you are a giver, there must be somewhere that you are getting. Because it's, it's not in their perception, it's not possible for you to just do something for nothing. Why? What's the catch? What's the catch? Why are you giving? Well, Ephraim was telling me, and I remember seeing this myself when I was in the hospital many times, Baruch Hashem how there are different organizations 
that come to the hospital, Jewish organizations that come to the hospital, and they see that you're there. If you're in a kid's department, they'll give the kids some toys, some candy. They'll bring sandwiches for the parents, whatever kashrut you need. Some are organizations, some are individuals just doing it on their own. A father and a son came in this morning and just asked for a friend, what sandwich do you want? He doesn't know him, he doesn't know anything about him. And he asked every room. He was him with his son. He asked everybody, what do you want to eat for breakfast? Why? Because he wanted to be godly. He wants to give. He wasn't looking for anything in return. And he went and he literally bought everybody a sandwich. Came back a little while later with a whole bucket full of sandwiches and he gave everybody, this is you, this is you, this is you. Oh, how much? No, nothing. I just want to give. That's it. Thank you for taking. Now this sounds nice and this sounds even something like some of us would want to do, but how come we can't do it in some of the most important parts of our lives like our relationships with our spouses, our relationships with our parents, our relationships with all those people that we say we love so much. We can sometimes do it with strangers, but we can't do it with those that are close to us. Now, this, what people like to call, you know, I, uh, they say, no, no, I'm not uh, doubting that you want to do good. You know, I'm just a skeptical type. You know, they give themselves some type of credibility for being skeptical. Say, listen, you want me to come? I'll do a shiur. Brother Ephraim will come do a shiur, no problem. Just get a few hundred people. We'll come. Well, how much do you charge? We don't charge. In fact, we bring a bunch of stuff and give books for free, give USBs for free. Okay, well, what's the catch? Nothing, there's no catch. We just want to teach Torah. Yeah, but where are you going to get it? Like, like what, how are you going to get us? Nothing, there is no get us. All you got to do is bring a lot of people. And we'll bring a bunch of stuff. That's it. No, no, no. Something's wrong here. And I'll start questioning you. Like, why are you doing this? Rabbi such and such, he takes 10,000. The other one, 20,000. That one, 20,000. This guy is a soldier that almost died, 50,000. This soldier that's still alive. You know, everybody takes money. You're free. What's going on? Why? Why? Why is free? And on top of it, you're going to give stuff for free. What's in this book that uh, you give it for free? Why? Why don't you sell it? Everybody else sells a book for 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 50 bucks. What's the catch? There's no catch. You don't want to take it, don't take it. No, no, but now I'm wondering. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. Wait, but you just said you wanted. You just said you did. If I, if I would have told you I'm charging 50000 you'd say, okay, no problem. And that's what happens. Why? This is already something that Satan has a track record with. The Midrash says... At the time of Avram Avinu, Avram was in the desert entering Egypt in order to get food. There was famine, there was drought. He needed to go to a place that had food. Egypt was the place at the time. But as he got there, they stopped him at the border and they said, Okay, you have to pay tax. He said, No problem. We'll have to look at your stuff. Sure, you don't have to. Just tell me how much and I'll pay for it. Just don't open anything. Just uh, tell me how much. Avram was hiding Sarah because of her beauty as he was scared that they would take her. He was hiding her from the Egyptians. And the Egyptians said, well, listen, uh, we'll have to evaluate this box over here like uh, it's full of uh, very uh, high-priced fabric. Avram said, no problem. Sure, I'll pay it. Here you go. No, 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 uh, not, not fabric. What? He said, yes, too quickly, right? Yeah. No, no, Muhammad really said, uh, not fabric, really uh, gold, like it's full of gold. Avram said, no problem. I'll pay. Oh, no, 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 no. Mustafa, Mustafa, Muhammad doesn't know. He doesn't make the rules here. He's just another thing. Mustafa said, full of diamonds. If it's full of diamonds, you have to pay tax on full of diamonds. The tax rate, on full, like as if it's full of diamonds. Avram said, no problem. Who do I make the check payable to? Oh, you even want to pay as if it's full of diamonds? Now we have to open it. 
because what you have must be priceless. They opened it and they saw Sarai Imenu and her beauty obviously was priceless and they took her and they brought her to Paro. But that's when HaKadosh Baruch Hu came in and punished all of them in order to make sure that they don't touch Sarai Imenu. But this nature, this so-called skepticism of good, skepticism of simply doing the will of Hashem, is very much in the nature of people. Why? When someone does not cleave themselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then they're cleaving themselves to something else. They're cleaving themselves to the Satan. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed the powers of the Satan to overcome his in this world. If that's the direction that one wants to go, he wants to be the taker, he wants to be the destroyer, he wants to be the negative force in the world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will allow him to do it. Even though the original image of God was given to him. He can destroy it. He can simply remove himself or herself away from it so far that the only thing that they know about the image of God is simply the words that they can manipulate in however way they want to justify their, their, their behavior. Now, when somebody really questions good, if somebody's questioning somebody that's questionable, meaning somebody has done a lot of evil, somebody was a missionary, convincing Jews to go to Christianity. And all of a sudden, he says, no, no, now I want the Jews to come and I'll teach them Torah. And you want to question that person, you have to. Why? Because he did a lot of bad. If someone was uh, Adolf Hitler, and now all of a sudden he wants to feed the poor, obviously, you can't believe such a person. Why? He can't just turn around from being the ultimate evil into being the ultimate good. He said, what about tshuva? What about repenting? Yes, repenting is a process. It doesn't mean that just because he says today he's good, we're just going to all jump in like he split the ocean for us. It's a process. But needless to say, there are some chachamim that say that if somebody did certain things that are really evil, such as missionizing and things like that, there are some chachamim that say, can't accept them ever. Now, of course, the halacha is not like that. You can't accept them if they've done tshuva. But it is certainly a process. You have to question them. You have to suspect them. But if somebody did, never gave you a reason to suspect them. In fact, all he's done is good. And now he's doing good, but you're questioning it. You're saying, well, you know, something smells here. That's because the stench is in your nose. It's not in them. You think evil. You would do evil. And therefore, you question other people that do good. Because you wouldn't do it. And you wouldn't understand why anybody else would do this good. The stench is in your nose. Now, marriage is one of the key places all of this applies in. Because when people are takers, and all they want is to take then they put themselves in a position where they are working against the clock of when either this relationship will be over or the stepping stones to it that usually happen, which is that the relationship deteriorates slowly but surely until it's over. Usually it's the latter. Usually it's the steps. So in the beginning... If you're the taker, and they're also the taker, and both of you are taking from each other, I'll do this if he does this. I'll buy him this if he buys me this. Oh, I'm not going to buy him a birthday present. He didn't buy me a birthday present. I'm not going to do this if he's not going to do this. And you're both in it to win it. You're thinking that you're playing Monopoly here. What ends up happening is, at some point, one of the takers decides that the deal is not worth it for him. Why? Because the last time, 
he did something for you and you didn't give him back something, the same thing, you figured, well, I gave her a diamond bracelet. All she gave me was a beautiful night, dinner, but I can go out and get dinner myself with a couple of friends tonight instead of uh, spending $5,000, $10,000 on a bracelet. And he decides to go with his friends. Last time that uh, he bought me uh, this uh, bracelet, I did such and such for him. I'm not really in the mood to do such and such. So you know what? I'm going to go to uh, dinner with my friends instead. And the taker starts doing further evaluation and doesn't necessarily want the give and take. And the relationship starts deteriorating where they start developing relationships with people that are not always takers. In fact, they start developing stronger relationships with people they're not married to. Friends, colleagues, all types of people that really don't want anything from them. They say, listen, you want to go out for a drink? Yeah, sure. That's not going to cost much. I don't have to open the door for him. I don't have to you know, say thank you, be appropriate. I could just be myself like we were at work. Have a drink, talk about nothing. Sounds like fun. And she thinks, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go out with my girlfriends. I'm going to go see a show. I don't have to dress a certain way, do a certain things, act a certain way. No, I can do whatever I want. And all of a sudden, they are more interested in hanging out with people and spending time with people that are not their spouse. Not because they don't love their spouse, but rather because they're not in the mood to give. And their friends, their colleagues, many times don't present themselves yet as takers. Sometimes they're in the same position. They're also running away from a given, you know, a give and take relationship. Now, the, the taker mentality is possessive, meaning they feel like everything has to be theirs to such an extent that there's this terminology that's used in the world today, practically in every language, where even if there is chas v'shalom, a, a divorce, a divorce. So when somebody says, uh, you know, so uh, how are you doing? What's going on? And let's just say you uh, just met with someone that you used to be married to. What do you call them? Oh, my ex-wife just left. My ex-wife just called me. Wait, your ex-wife? Wife is something that is yours. Husband is yours. But ex, why, why do you still have that connection? In Hebrew, it's grushati. Grushati meaning she's my divorce. Same thing, same concept. As if you still have some type of ownership of this. Why? She's only my ex-wife. She's only my, he's only my ex-husband. No, he's not your husband. You used to be married, but you're not husband and wife anymore. Yeah, but he's my ex-husband. No. You broke up, that's it. He's a stranger now. He happens to be the father of the same children. She happens to be the mother of the same children, but that's it. There's no wife. No, no, no. What do you mean? We have a history together and just this. And that's the thing. The mentality of the taker is that everything is theirs, even something that's not. If they put their hands on it at some point, if they owned it at some point, if they sell something, they'll tell somebody, yeah, you know what? That piece of uh, property over there, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I built it. Is it yours? No. So, so why are you mentioning it? No, no, I'm just telling you. It's nice, right? Yeah, so I, I did it. It's a constant mention of like to get credits. Of I own and I did and my this and my that. That is the mentality of a taker. A taker is constantly possessive over everything. Now, the problem with this mentality, aside from everything we've talked about already, is that the problem doesn't end where we said. The problem transfers from generation to generation. And what ends up happening is that a parent that's a taker 
is also going to teach their kids to be takers. And the kids will teach their kids takers. Or better yet, even if the parent is not a taker, but they're not exactly so uh, ambitious about their giving, if somebody else teaches their kids to be takers, or their kids learn in some way or another to be takers, they're not necessarily going to try to influence their kids otherwise. Why? Because they're afraid also that their kids will be, what? A frayer, a sucker. Oh, what? You gave all your toys and your friends play with your toys? What they give you? Oh, nothing? Don't share with them anymore. Don't share with them anymore. Oh, what did you do? You were nice to them? You gave everybody candy? And what, they were mean to you? Okay, so don't talk to them anymore. What about the mitzvah from the Torah, one of the 613 mitzvot? Lotikom vilotitor. You're not allowed to take revenge. No, 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 it's not nice that people are just taking from him. Why? Why not it's not nice? You only take from Hashem? Why, so he's supposed to be a sucker? It depends how you view it. Do you view Hashem as a sucker? And what happens is, Rabotai, and what's happening as we speak, is that relationships are being destroyed because people literally sit at their coffee table sit at their dinner table with a list of requests of what they want their spouse to do. I need you to do this. I want you to do this. You need to do this. The how are yous, how was your day, tell me how I can help you, simply disappeared from the, 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 the mentality of people altogether. Oh, it's my time with him? Okay, so now I can ask him for this and this and this and this and this. All I want to do is eat. Why do I have to hear 500,000 things? Well, what am I else am I going to talk to you? I don't know. Perhaps another time. Can't, no, no, no. This is my time. I need this and this and this and this. And then people are surprised that their spouse doesn't want to eat with them anymore. They're surprised that their spouse doesn't want to be with them anymore, be next to them anymore. Their best communication is text messaging each other just to check that they're still alive and answering the text message and the phone bill was paid. Face to face, they barely want to talk. Why? Because it's a constant request list. He wants to go on vacation with his friends. She wants to go on vacation with our friends. And what ends up happening with this type of mentality is that kids learn from that. And that's what has transpired in our generation. Where people are constantly mentioning the problem without mentioning the solution as often. What is the problem? What is the problem? The problem they call the Shiduch crisis. What's a Shiduch crisis? People are not finding somebody to get married to. Well, how could it be? There's a bunch of girls that want to get married. There's a bunch of boys that want to get married. Get this one to meet that one. Here you go, married, mazel tov. No, 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 you don't understand. It's hard to find somebody today. What hard? They're everywhere. There's plenty of people that want to get married. No, but you don't understand. This one, he was a nice guy, but his parents are very poor. And that one, he's a very nice guy, but he's too into the Torah and, and just like he wants to be an avrech. We need him to be a businessman. And that one, he's a businessman, but he, he's not really successful. And we don't know how to tell him that maybe he should go work for somebody. And that one, he's, what can I say? He's, he's Sephardic. We're Ashkenazi. It's like Shatnez. It's like Shatnez. Can't do that. And that one, he's way too short for her. And that one, he's too old. 15 years old enough. What he could be our grandfather. I've never met a grandfather that's 15 years older, but nonetheless, he could be our grandfather. He's 15 years older than her. And this one, he's missing on this. He's that miss. Oh, nobody's good for your little princess. Oh, and Hashem Yishmo, when it comes to the guys. Oh, Rabbi, I'm really looking to get married. I'm serious. Okay, no problem. How about this one? Ah, Rabbi, uh, you know. Is there somebody that's a little bit more like, uh, you know, athletic? Huh? What do you mean? No, somebody that's like a little bit more athletic. 
What do you want it to be? A football player? A baseball player? Or a hockey player? What do you mean? No, you know, a rabbi, like athletic, I don't know, maybe she could run. Tell her to run with you. She'll run with you and, uh, I don't know, on a treadmill in the house. No, you know what I mean, rabbi. You know, it's like a little bit, you know, oh, you mean like the pornography star that you saw in the movies for the last 20 years. That's what you want? Oh, yeah, well, I, I, I don't want to say it that way. Oh, so that's what you're looking for? Okay, don't call me anymore. Go, 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 go back to, the, go, go back to your sins. What? I just said I want athletic. No, no, you don't want athletic. You want imaginary. You want imaginary. That's what you want. You want an imagination. You want somebody you saw on TV. Oh, you got a guy, listen. I'm really, I'm getting ready to get married. Oh, yeah, well, you should be ready. Oh, you're 35 years old. Before you know it, you're going to be a grandfather without grandkids. You have anybody? Sure, no problem. You send them, ooh, Rabbi, listen. Uh, she, she seems nice. She seems really, really nice. Okay, she seems nice. You haven't talked to her, but she seems nice. Sure, she's, a, you know, what? she's nice. So what, what's the problem? No, you don't understand. She has... I don't know. I don't want to seem like I'm picky, but she has blonde hair. I'm not really. I'm not really into that. Huh? What? What do you mean? She has blonde hair. What difference does it make to you? I don't know. I don't really. I don't. I don't I'm not really into the whole blonde. She covers her hair with a mitpachad after she gets married. Yeah, but you know, you know, I'm like, I'm like, you know, like. I'm, you know, I'm like Sephardi and like, you know, like we're like darker and we like that, you know, I don't want to have like little, little, you know, Swedish kids, you know, what's Swedish? What are you talking about? You're lucky if you have kids, if a Kadosh who gives you kids, it may be a curse to the world if they have your personality. What are you talking about? You, you're, you're looking at the hair. That's how you're going to pick who you're going to marry. That's how you're going to pick who you're going to marry. She's blonde. She's brunette. She's red. She's blue. She's the, that's what is important to you in your life. Chamor, chamor, time. You're lucky anybody would look at you. No, but you know, but I'm Moroccan, so I really want a Moroccan. What Moroccan? What, what are you, eating her? You're going to build a family. And people don't understand. Why? Because either he doesn't have enough money, or she doesn't have enough money, or they don't live in the neighborhood that they want to live, or doesn't have the right job. Or they don't have this. Or they don't have that. And people are literally looking for some white horse. Everyone is looking for some white horse that they, can, they found in their fantasy and they're f chasing after that horse. But they don't realize the horse died. When? When you were supposed to get married. It died already. And being picky is not only something that's not good. It's literally forces of the Satan. Why? Because you're picky, because you're not looking to give. You're looking for someone that can give to you. Somebody that can give to you the looks and the bank account and the this and all the different things that you want. You're not looking for a husband. You're looking for a shopping list. You're not looking for a wife. You're looking for a credit card. You're not looking for a, a, a spouse. You're looking for a portfolio. This is the problem. There is no shiduch crisis. I've said this for the last 10 years. There's midot crisis. People have terrible behavior and therefore they cannot find anybody to match. No one is pretty, no one is uh, this, no one is rich enough, no one is poor enough, no one is... It's constantly, no one is a, has enough. And if you get the parents involved, it doubles the effect. Why? Because nobody is good enough for little Yankale. No one is good enough for little Sarah Le. No one is good enough for my daughter. No one is good enough for my son. And everyone has a moom. They turn everybody into a Baal moom. Why? Even if the son didn't care about the money, the mother cares about the money. What are you going to do? What if your business goes down? What if you get fired? How are you going to survive? Our father doesn't have any money. Our this brother doesn't have any money. Oh, that's these types of thoughts. Why? Because, Rabotai, when you are a taker, you're not looking for anything that you can contribute. You're looking for what can you get. And what ends up happening, Rabotai, the further we get from giving, the more in line we get with the Satan. Now, if you think this is simply my opinion, 
Let's look at what the sages said. The Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin, page 41a, says from the ladies at the time, every woman would rather would be would say it's better for me to be married to anyone, to any husband, than to be alone. This was the mentality of our grandparents. Meaning, it's better to be married to anyone, not only not the white horse, but literally anyone, just not to be alone for another day. Not to be like a widow. Not to be like a divorcee. Not to be another day older without having a husband. Now, if you think that is bad enough, think, oh, maybe they weren't picky. Okay. Now, here's the obligation on every single person out there. If they say they believe in a Torah and they're not married yet, either because of their parents or because of their own pickiness and stinginess and whatever it is, this is what Torah says. Gemara, Masechet Psachim. You remember those shurim that I said? We had all the details about Gehenim and Kafakela and the relationship with Eliyahu and Navi, all those wonderful things. One of the constant personalities of Kedusha that appears in all of those stories is Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi was Kodesh Kodeshim to the extent that Akadosh Baruch Hu allowed him to go into Gan Eden alive. He never died. He went to Gan Eden alive. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Gemara, Masechet Psachim, page 113a. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says three things in the name of the men of Yerushalayim. These are three critical important, important lessons. One of those is if your daughter has reached maturity and she's still single, what's maturity? She's mature. In those days, could be 12 years old, 14 years old, 12 years old is but mitzvah. She's already considered a woman. In today's world, it's 18. 18 year old woman. If your daughter has reached maturity and she's not married, free your slave and give him to her to get married to. What? Huh? Again. If your daughter has reached maturity and she has not gotten married, why? Maybe she's too picky. Maybe she's ugly. Maybe she's this. Maybe she's that. Bottom line, it's not happening. But you are well-to-do. You have enough money. You have a slave. In those days, it was very much common behavior for people to have slaves. Even though today it's frowned upon, although there are countless slaves in the world, they just call them different names. Nonetheless, having a slave was everyday business until recent history. Now you were one of the people that was wealthy enough to have a slave. You had a slave. Slaves usually were non-Jews. Non-Jews. You had a Canaanite slave used to be an idol worshiper, used to be somebody that prayed to some statue, but now he became your slave. Slave is your property. What does that mean, your property? He's like owning a business today. You have a business, you have a laundromat, you have a, uh, I don't know, a, uh, a car washing place, you have something, that slave makes you money. Whether he's uh, taking care of the horses, he's washing the clothes, he's fixing the house, he's building a house, whatever he is, he does whatever he wants. He's a money maker. The slave is worth money. You can buy, you can sell. That's how it was. And for all of those people that are, you know, I'm against slaves. Okay, then stop using blue collar workers. Stop going to buy, have people make you lunch, make you food, make you everything. And by the way, you can't even get clothes anymore. Why? Because it's all done by three people that call them, that in essence are the equivalent of slaves. To spare me the, the, uh, the uh, political correctness of I'm against slaves nonsense. Of course, slaves does not mean what they did to the African Americans where they abused them, tortured them, killed them, raped them, and so on. That's not what slavery is according to the Torah. If, you, uh, if, if, a, uh, if a Jewish master 
uh, takes, uh, takes uh, let's say, hurts his slave, and let's say the slave loses the eye, he has to free him. Not allowed to just beat them senseless, kill them, anything. If he kills them, it's a death penalty. Can't just uh, do whatever you want, like what the uh, uh, Americans did. And many other people did. Talking about slave according to the Torah. The slave, in essence, does what the master tells him to do. He tells him to go build a, uh, another uh, shack. He builds a shack. Take care of the horses, takes care of the horses. Whatever it is that he does, he has to do it. This slave is a asset. Now, you have one, right? You have one. Would you want your daughter to marry him? Probably not. Why? He doesn't have any money. He doesn't come from a good family. What's his job prospects? Until now, he was a slave. So it doesn't look like he has some bright future ahead. But according to the Torah, the situation of having a daughter that's already at maturity and is not married is much worse than all of your opinions about slaves. Why? Your slave is single, he's capable, free him. Part of the freeing of the slave is that he converts to Judaism because while he's a slave, he keeps the mitzvot but like a woman. He doesn't have to put on tefillin, he doesn't have to do all the things that men do, but he has to keep the mitzvot. He can't continue being an idol worshiper. Now this slave has been with you for five, six, seven, ten years, whatever it is. He knows already what it's like to be Jewish, but now he's going to be free, meaning he's going to be just like you. He's going to be a complete Jew, completely free. Doesn't have to do anything you tell him anymore. Why? He now becomes your son-in-law. Make the slave your son-in-law. Why? Because for you to have a daughter that's roaming around 25 years old and not married is so awful in the eyes of a Kadosh Baruch Hu that literally you have to do something about it as soon as possible. Now what happens is, Rabbi Karim, is that people don't have this perception. If you tell a woman, listen, young lady, you're already 23, you're already 28, you're already 36, you're already 40. There's no time for you to be picky. There's no time for you to be picky if he doesn't have enough, he doesn't want enough, he doesn't go enough, he doesn't this enough. There's no time for you to be picky. Why? According to the Torah, if your father had a slave, you would have had to free him just so you can marry the guy. That's how bad it is for you to be alone. But why is this the case? Why is it better for the woman to go marry a slave that now becomes a full-blown Jew? No different than her. Full rights, full everything. In fact, you're now, gonna, now that he converts, you have to love him more than you even love a natural-born Jew because he's a convert. This slave, former slave, gets a really great deal. He goes from slavery to being a complete Jew, complete freedom. He's going to get some money from the father-in-law now. Why, after all, he's married to his daughter. This guy just won the lotto. Another perfect example of how different slavery is in the eyes of a Torah versus the eyes of people. And what they did to people and what the Jews did. And I'm talking about Torah observant Jews, not just anyone that calls themselves a Jew just because their mother is Jewish. In the eyes of a Torah, this slave gets a fantastic deal. He's now able to marry his boss's daughter, he may even end up inheriting his former owner's entire business because now he's the son-in-law. Why? It's that horrible to have a daughter that's not married and now is already at maturity. Lest she become promiscuous, lest she become a person that thinks that she has permission to get married whenever she feels like it when she's established her career, when she's made enough money, when he, all of these mentalities all come from the Satan. Why the Satan? Because you're thinking with the Satan mindset of, I need to have this and that amount of money in order to get married to her or in order to get to marry to him because I need to have enough for them to take from me. 
I need enough for me to be able to justify to take from them. You see, it's a taker mentality. You say, yeah, but if I want to have a lot, that means I want to give. No, no, you don't want to give. You want to make yourself suitable for someone to take from you. You want to have enough money, so therefore in your perverted vision, you will be suitable to take from. You'll have enough money that someone would want to marry you. You'd have enough possessions that someone would want to take you. And this is the problem. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, when you go deeper into that Gemara, explains to us, when you are a giver and not a taker, it doesn't matter that he was a former slave. Why? Because right now, they can both give to each other instead of take from each other. We don't care that he doesn't have any money. We'll give him money. So he can establish his life. We'll give her money so she can establish her life. The point is, is that you don't need all of these things that society has told you you need in order to get married, in order to be happily married. Many times people ask the question of, you know, can I use birth control because I don't know if I could afford another kid? That's never a consideration. There's no such thing as not having kids because you don't think you could afford them. If you're unhealthy, you just gave birth in the last year, even the last two years, and you still not recovered from it, okay, that's certainly a consideration, and you don't have to reproduce right this second. You could wait up to two years. But if your only reason of why you're not going to try to become pregnant and have children is because of money, you have the wrong mentality. You have the wrong mentality. You have a mentality of a taker, not a giver. And this Rabotai is one of the things that is literally destroying our communities. People are looking at relationships the wrong way. They're looking at relationships as what can I get from him? What can I get from her? If you look at Am Yisrael's history, and I'm not talking about Am Yisrael's history from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm not talking about the time of Am Yisrael at the time of, uh, you know, Rabbi Yashua ben Levi, 2,000 years ago. I'm not even talking about Am Yisrael at the time of the Rambam 800 years ago. Look at it 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago. You look at some of the righteous people that got married. If somebody, even now, if you look at the religious communities, you'll see guys that are single, 30 years old, get married to women that are divorced with three, four kids. He doesn't have any kids, but he'll marry a woman that has kids. Why? We'll have more kids together. Yeah, but what about she has three kids with somebody else? So what? I can help her with those kids. No, but it's not your kids. Yeah, but it's Hashem's kids. It's Hashem's kids. People literally would get married not based on what can I get from this girl, but rather how can I help her? She has kids. Her husband died. She's a widow. I could help her with the kids. He has kids. His wife died. I can help him with the kids. He's 50. I'm 25. I'm 30. I'm 35. He's looking for a wife. I'm looking for a husband. Perfect match. Yeah, but there's a 15, 20 year difference. Some of the greatest chachamim that we ever had in our history married women for their second marriage when their original wife died or, or, or something happened, sometimes the marriage would be literally a 30 year difference. Right now, right now, the story broke the news just a couple of weeks ago. One of the great chachamim in Eretz Israel was married for 50 years. 50 years he was married, almost 60 years married. Never had a kid. Never had a kid. He got married again six years ago. He got married at 86 years old or 85 years old to a woman that was in her 50s. 30 plus year difference. And guess what? Akadosh Baruch Hu blessed them with a child. He had a kid at over 90 years old. Why? Because Akadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. 
And the people that know this Chacham say that for over 65 years he prayed every single day for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give him a son. Okay, I understand you got married 70 years ago. You're praying for a son, no problem. Didn't work out for the first five years. You continue praying, no problem. Didn't work out after 10, 20 years. You continue praying, no problem. 50 years, you didn't have a son. 60 years, you didn't have a son. You're 80 something years old. You're still praying for what? That's what the mentality of a kofer would say. Why are you praying? Oh, so you think that Hashem has limitation just because I'm 90 years old and she's almost 60 years old, we can't have a son? That means you believe in you. I believe in Hashem. He got married to a woman and he had a son. The Brit Mila was literally like a week and a half ago. Why? He wanted a wife. She wanted a husband. I can help him. She can help me. Yalla, let's get married. Mazel tov. And while we're at it, let's have a kid too. Have a kid? He's 90 years old. Yeah, why not? Why not? The only limited God is the God that's in your mind, not the God in Shemaim, not the God that's all over the world, not Enod Milvado. But Rabotai Karim, when you're going into a relationship, in order to take, you're never going to give a Kadosh Baruch Hu the chance to give you all he wants to give you. Why? Because you've decided what you want. You've decided what you want. And therefore, no one will ever be enough for you, even the one that you choose. No one will ever be enough for you. And that's one of the biggest most horrific problems in our society today, both Jews and non-Jews, but needless to say, more so on us Jews that are observant than anyone else because we're supposed to be better. We're supposed to know better. You see, Rabotai Karim, when Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, free your slave so he can marry your daughter, that means that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is telling you, don't be a taker. Be a giver. You can give your daughter a husband. You can give this slave freedom. You can give them a life and an opportunity to build a family. Yeah, but I'm going to lose uh, one of my assets. He makes me 100000 a year. So? So? Is it better to have an asset than a grandkid? Or two? Or ten? And that's the mentality of what we're supposed to have. But if the mentality continues to be the way it is, then misery will continue to grow. Loneliness will continue to grow. No one will ever be good enough for your little Sarale. No one will ever be good enough for your Yankale. No one will ever be good enough for you, even if you choose them yourself. Because after you choose them and you realize that one day they didn't feel like giving you and you were in the mood to take because you're a taker and you thought that they're going to give you whatever you want and they simply don't have it anymore or don't want to give it anymore. And guess what? They're no longer good enough. And in reality, they were never good enough for someone that's a taker. They certainly were good enough and even more than enough for someone that's a giver. If you're a giver, much easier to make a choice. Much easier. Why? Because you can give everyone. What about the notion of being a friar? A sucker? That means you're like God. That means that you are giving endlessly. Just like God gives endlessly. And this Rabotai is a mentality that we have to somehow convince ourselves to absorb, convince ourselves to do. We have to find a way to give each and every single day, and I don't just mean money. Certainly giving to help other people money when you have it, certainly it's an obligation, not a suggestion. In fact, Chazal tell us that if a person has an opportunity to give tzedakah and they don't, they're considered as similar to someone who's an idol worshiper. Why? 
Why are they considered symbol of someone that's like an idol worshiper? Rabbi Yoshua ben Kocha says, just like those people turned their, turned their heads away from Hashem and went, went to idol worship. In the Torah, one that turns away from giving to someone that they can give, that Hashem put in front of them, and they turn their, way, their head away, they're turning their head away from what Hashem gave them, opportunity Hashem gave them. They're considered literally equivalent to those that worship idols. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak says, the Holy One, blessed be He, sends His people who are deserving of charity so that the person can reap reward. He brings you opportunities to give tzedakah so you can get reward. You have extra money that you don't need to eat, to drink. Give tzedakah. Why? It's your opportunity. No, but I already gave last week. But this opportunity only arrives this week. Yeah, but why do I have to give all the time? Don't you want to be like God? Yeah, but I was like God last week. Oh, so it's enough for you to be like God only one time? So you don't really believe in this. You believe in being God sometimes. Sometimes. But God says, Mi ekdimani ve'ashalem. Who did me a favor first and I'll pay him. Meaning there's no such thing as you doing anything for Hashem without a Kadosh Baruch Hu paying you. There's no such thing. So then he'll say, oh, when he really doesn't want to give, he'll give the same argument as the famous heretic, Tonus Hofus. If God really loved these poor people, if God really loved this Torah organization, if God really loved this thing that you're telling me to give to, why don't he just give it to them? Why do I have to give it to them? You're not giving it to them. Hashem is giving you a chance to give it to them. And if you really want the reason, says Rabbi Akiva, Tonus Hofus, Akadosh Baruch Hu makes certain people Rich. Rich meaning they have more than what they need. Not necessarily rich like they have buildings and castles. They have more than what they need. And he also makes specific people poor. Why? Because those rich people have made certain sins which means they'll have to go to Gehenom for them. And since HaKadosh Baruch doesn't want them to go to Gehenom, he gives them opportunity to get out of it. How? Giving tzedakah to the poor people that need. They become his messengers. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu's messengers can get themselves out of Gehenom. He makes them poor. And he makes them rich in order to make a shiduch between them. If they know why he gave them money, which is to give. Now when a person is a taker, they will have a completely different mentality. The mentality would be, I'm only going to give if I can get something in return. I'm only going to give if I can get something in return. And that's not a good person to be married to and certainly not a good person to be. And that's why Rabbi Yashur ben Levi gave us an extreme example that it's so bad to have a mentality of being picky on a shiduch and waiting for this white horse to appear, this, this, this perfect knight with perfect complexion and a perfect bank account and a perfect car and a perfect house and a perfect life. So they can give you all these perfect things that you want. That he says to you, it's better that you're married to a slave than to stay the way you are waiting for this white horse, waiting for this knight that you're waiting for. Why? Because you're waiting for something you really shouldn't. You're waiting for somebody to give you. It's time for you to realize you are the one that's supposed to give. Yeah, what about him? Focus on you. If you give, your spouse will reciprocate. Why? That's the shidduch that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you. The Gemara in Masichet Sotah in the first daf says, every person gets somebody just like themselves. That means... If you are a giver, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you a giver. If you're a taker, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you a taker. Because that's the shiduch. That's what you made for yourself. Now, when a person looks at things from that perspective, they realize that staying alone is not only not favored in the eyes of Hashem, 
not favored in the eyes of the Torah, but rather it's saying that you are not where you're supposed to be mentally. Even if you put on tefillin, even if you learn Torah, even if you do mitzvot. And that's why Chazal said, a man that's not married, his Torah is as if he has no Torah. His simcha, his happiness, is non-existent. No Torah, no simcha, and even the blessings that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bestow upon him, he can't. Why? It was supposed to be bestowed upon a complete neshama, him and her. And that's also why the Gemara in Masechet Sota brings the Mishnah where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Ish ve'isha zachu shechina b'neim. When there's a man and a woman, they have shlom bayit, the shechina comes to that house and rests upon that house. Why? Hashem says, look, these two got together because he wants to give her and she wants to give him. I want to be in a place like this. Why? These are my kids. They look like me. I give, they give. I want to be there. I want to be there. I want to give. And they want to give. Ah, so I want to, that, that looks like my house. That looks like my house. When our minds think of what I can get from every single opportunity, we're thinking like the Satan. When our minds think of what can I give, we're thinking like Hashem. The beautiful part of all of this is that this mentality can be applied to every single aspect of your life, not just your marriage. It can be applied to your raising your kids. It can be applied to your relationship with colleagues. It can be applied to a relationship with your coworkers, your, uh, your uh, customers, your business. It can be applied everywhere. When you are constantly giving, the world will reciprocate. But when you're constantly looking to take, 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 eventually the world will also reciprocate that taking. And sometimes, most times, and eventually, the taking is uneven and you end up losing. Why? Because anyone that goes with the Satan ultimately loses four times more than what he gave. That's why the one that stole the goat that's caught has to give four back. He went with the Satan, he stole, he has to pay fourfold. This Rabotai Karim is one of the critical lessons that we just gave a little tidbit of it. Last week, we talked about marriage. When a couple has problems, where there's a disconnect, one spouse feels like the other one doesn't want to be next to them. One spouse feels like the other one doesn't love them. If it's real love, it doesn't just disappear. It's not air. Usually what ends up happening is that when there's a taker mentality, then one of the people gets tired of giving. So because they're tired of giving or they're not in the mood to give, they take a step back, they go to a place or even to a person that at least presents themselves like they don't want anything from them. They'll go out with their friends, they'll go out with a colleague, they'll even be alone. Why? They're tired of people asking them for stuff. They're tired of you asking them for stuff. But if you focus on giving, you'll see that your relationship will turn into heaven. Your love, your affection, your connection will turn into something that you didn't even imagine possible. In every aspect of your life, if when you become a giver, you become godly. You become what you were created in the image of God. There's nothing greater than that. Now, of course, the world around us can easily make fun of it. Just like the Gemara in Masechet Sota, the last daf, says that before Mashiach comes, there's going to be all types of things that turn upside down. 
Chutzpah is gay. There's going to be a lot of obnoxious behaviors. And one of the things that's going to happen is that anyone that shows even the resemblance of fear of heaven will be mocked as if they're a sucker, a frail, a loser, a crazy person. Don't worry what everybody thinks. In the beginning, they may make fun of you. But at the end, they'll ask you for blessings because you'll be the only one that's happily married. Listen to the Torah. No one ever loses doing that. Be'ezrat Hashem, you take this, you apply it to your lives, because once you apply this, all of the other lessons we've learned together over the last decade will make a whole lot more sense and will be much easier to apply than ever before. Kol Tuv, Pachaba for anyone that wants to support our organization and all the wonderful things that our organization gives to the world for free whether it's the USBs or the books or the lectures or the food or the money, all the wonderful things. You want to be a partner with us, go to bezlatashem.org or bhtorah.org or any of the other wonderful ways that we have that HaKadosh Baruch allowed us to be able to be a vessel for you to give so we can give. Call to Bacha We'll see each other Bezat Hashem next week as there's no other shiur later this week. We have uh, some uh, family events this week that we have to take care of Bezat Hashem. But I promise, Be'ezot Hashem, we will learn even more later next week. Call to B'cha B'atzlacha. את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהם הלכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן.